just pick up my pens, you can't get the staff these days. Okay. So, uh, thank you for that. Um, I was thinking the other day, actually, the last time I did any kind of public speaking was in this very hall uh, approximately 21 years ago. Because when I was a, a student here, I was um, a keen member of the Literary Society, I don't know if that's still going, and uh, the uh, school debating team, which is pretty geeky, I know. But um, I actually found being involved in those roles did um, help me somewhat in my time at school. Firstly, I found that um, it gave the bullies something tangible to focus on, and uh, secondly, it helped me develop my confidence for speaking in front of crowds like this. Now, obviously, it was 20 years ago. When Max first got in touch with me a few months back to invite me to take part in these talks, I jumped at the opportunity, and then as it dawned on me, um, my confidence sort of ebbed away a little bit. But at that stage, it was too late to pull out, um, so I'm here now. Uh, <laughs> thankfully, I'm on quite familiar territory, so hopefully things will go okay. If not, I'll just start sniffing the marker pens. Um, <laughs> so, uh, as it said in my introduction, uh, I'm an illustrator, I've been an animator before that, and I spent the best part of my life, really, uh, drawing. So I thought I'd, what I'd do is start by uh, doing a drawing. Uh, I was born in the 70s, so I'm going to draw a space hopper. So it's just a big round ball, essentially. Oops. With knobbly handles. Seem to remember. And for some reason, they had a really scary face, like a kind of kangaroo with myxomatosis, I seem to remember. <laughs> so, it's going to have a nose, wonky teeth, and it looks something like that, I seem to remember. Anyway, it's a very rough rendition of a space hover. Um, now, I'm going to colour it in. So those of you with OCD or a penchant for being tidy might want to look away at this point, because I'm going to do this. Oh, whoops, I've gone over the lines. Oh. For those of you who don't know Sir Kenneth Robinson, he's a sort of educational consultant or guru, and um, he's uh, a brilliant raconteur. He's exceptionally witty, and he kind of carries his quiet charisma, uh, which is why I've chosen to plagiarise him tonight. And... Uh, in his talk, he focuses on, at one point, how children just seem to plough into problems, totally unafraid of making any mistakes, and that's how they learn. And um, so he uses one anecdote to illustrate this, and he centres on his son's nativity play, and the three wise men are about to go on stage. And as they go on stage, they get their order slightly muddled, but they carry on regardless. The first boy goes up, like he's meant to, and he approaches Mary and Joseph and the newborn baby Jesus, and he hands out his box and says, I bring the gift of gold. Then the second boy goes up a little bit early, he gets on stage and he says, I bring myrrh. So then the final boy arrives, realises they've gone a bit out of sync, but it doesn't matter, he carries on. He goes up, presents his box and says, Frank sent this. <laughs> now, it is a pretty funny anecdote, isn't it? You can see why I stole it now. Um, so basically, what Sir Kenneth Robinson concludes from this humorous episode is that if you're not prepared to be wrong, you can't come up with anything original. Now, the same is true of children's drawings. And I've got an example here, if I can operate this thing. There we go. Right, so I know this is probably a bit small for you, but this is a portrait of me, which was done by my daughter and given to me uh, last Father's Day. You can see there, it says Daddy at the top. Now, the first thing you'll probably notice about this image, I hope you'll notice, is that it looks nothing like me, right? <laughs> For a start, I don't know why, but I've got a shock of vertical turquoise hair. Um, I, goodness knows why. Uh, my hands and feet seem to look like tarantulas that have wilted in the sun. I've got a second head growing out of my torso. <laughs> And the less we say about the slender man in the background here, the better. <laughs> so, obviously I'm teasing, I love this picture. And uh, what it shows is a bold and carefree attempt uh, to try and capture what my daughter believes is my essence, my personality. Either that or she needs serious psychiatric treatment. <laughs> but as Kenneth Robinson says, if you're not prepared to be wrong, you'll never come up with anything original. Case in point, right there. 
Now, in a way, our education's a bit like that. We have these sorts of guidelines that are laid out for us, and then we work our way until we get to what's meant to be a chosen career at the end. Now, I remember back in the fifth form, uh, the careers advice I received, and there was this initiative called ISCO Morrisby, which I think is still going today, um, and basically it involved pupils having to fill out various questionnaires, lots of multiple choice boxes to tick, and then you sit an interview, and then all the data's collated, fed into a big machine, and you basically wait to have your fortune told. And the results are rendered out, and it tells you the career you're going to do. Now, with me, I didn't just get one career option. Oh, no. I got two. And uh, this is absolutely true. This is what it said. I was given the choice of either being a diplomat, pretty snazzy, or a car mechanic. <laughs> now, you couldn't get two more incongruous career paths if you tried, diplomat or car mechanic. I'm not sure what I was meant to take away from that whether I was going to get a call from the United Nations and suddenly be whisked away to North Korea to fix the alternator on Kim Jong-un's Fiat Punto, or I don't know. It made no sense to me. The truth of the matter is, I was a teenager. I didn't have the first clue what I wanted to be. I was too concerned about getting a wedgie before the next house debating competition. You know, they were troubling times. Now, admittedly, there are careers which have a specific vocational point to them, and you have to fulfil certain qualifications and attain certain skills to get to that career. Uh, my niece, for instance, she, um, is, well, she wants to be a vet, basically, and she's doing chemistry, uh, maths and biology, and she's currently scouring the country looking for a university so she can study there once she's finished her exams. Now, that level of focus and determination is extraordinary for a six-year-old girl. But, um, <laughs> and obviously I'm joking, she's 17, but I think she did make up her mind about being a vet when she was six. And um, I'm sure there are lots of you here tonight who also have a firm grasp on what you want to do when you leave this school, and you'll be currently equipping yourselves with the skills and the qualifications to achieve that, and that's great. But then there's the other end of the spectrum, where I dwelt, uh, and there'll be a few of you here tonight as well who fall into that category, who are more like concussed hamsters wandering around a labyrinth. Um, you'll know who you are because you'll be the ones giving serious consideration to doing a degree in English literature. Um, I'm, I'm teasing because... I, sorry, I'm one of you. I was there. Um, in fact, I distinctly remember uh, finishing my English degree and then thinking to myself, right, what am I going to do with this? I still don't have the answer to that question, by the way, um, in case you were wondering. Uh, but I do remember my very last English tutorial, and my tutor was trying to reassure the students about our career prospects, and he was saying, not to worry, because statistically, 90% of us would leave with uh, a full-time job. He then went on to say that 90% of those candidates would be working in a fast food restaurant. Um, and then he got up and left and closed the door and I never saw him again. And that was literally the last line in my entire academic career. That's what it all boiled down to, this point. This line here, all those <coughs> revision timetables, uh, exercise books, ink cartridges, calculator batteries, detentions, it all boiled down to that moment. Now, I know what you're thinking. That's a very depressing note to end a talk on. But the good news is, I haven't quite finished yet, but I can't promise that it won't get more depressing. <laughs> Where do I go from here? One of the good things about having such obtuse career options is it essentially grants you a blank page to colour in all over again. So, where did I go? I'll tell you where. I came exactly back here. Quite literally, my first employment paycheck was from this very school. Obviously, I wasn't a teacher, I was too overqualified for that. <laughs> I, I worked in the maintenance department. And I remember on my first day, I let slip to the foreman, Mike Hancock, that uh, I um, used to do art A-level. And so 
He responded by thrusting a paintbrush into one hand, a five litre bucket of magnolia emulsion into the other, and said, there you go, Picasso, go and paint the classroom block. So that was the summer of 96 for me. Now, if you had asked me back then if I thought that job would in any way shape or inform the person I am today, I'd have said no, not at all. Although I did learn some pretty spectacular new swear words off the crew. Um, but the truth is, um, it's very easy to overlook menial jobs that we often take just to make ends meet. But the fact of the matter is, um, while they may not be along the lines of what we want to do, they nevertheless play an integral part in how we get there. So take, for instance, the um, modern classical composer Philip Glass. I'm sure some of the music students here will have heard of him. And people who haven't heard of him will certainly have heard one of his many film scores. Now, he didn't receive his first professional commission until he was 41. Before that, he um, worked in a steel mill in his hometown and then as a taxi driver in New York. Now, he said that um, he was driven for his curiosity for life and that, any dis and that trumped any disdain he might have had for uh, working. And if we look um, at Harvey Picard, the American comic writer, he proves that being in the employment doldrums can actually be a great catalyst for creativity. A lot of his stories and characters are based on the real-life characters he met every day in his dead-end job as a filing clerk at the local hospital. I myself uh, made my first short film when I was um, in between temping jobs <coughs> having just moved back into my parents' house in my early 20s after splitting up with my girlfriend. Happy days. So, you know, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, <laughs> so, basically, I then went on to do a uh, three-month kind of post-grad animation course in Bristol, where I now live, and eventually I started getting some freelance work as an animator. I started out in uh, children's TV programmes, and also, I made some short films that really are not for children, but were a lot of fun to make anyway. And unfortunately, the budget and the funding started to fall out of the animation market in the UK at that time. So the work dried up, but then I was lucky enough to get a full-time job at a digital agency doing animation for children's educational apps and games and stuff like that. But then as computers got more and more involved, the job seemed to become more perfunctory than creative. So I decided to take another drastic diversion and I quit my full-time job and um, I decided to go back to being a freelancer and working in children's illustration. And it was the best decision I've ever made, providing I don't open my bank statements. Now, I've got another example for you of one of my illustrations from my book. There you go. So, the good thing about being a children's illustrator is that essentially I get to colour over the lines all over again. So here is an image from my second book, The Lumberjack's Beard. It's available in all good bookshops and some pretty naff ones. And you can rent it from the library for free so you don't have an excuse. <coughs> so here we see basically the trees are essentially triangles on sticks. The clouds and the shadows are just scribbles. And there's no way that hefty lumberjack could live in such a tiny log cabin. So basically, Everything technically is wrong with this picture, a bit like my daughter's image, but that's what makes it so right. Um, basically, one of the hardest parts of my job these days, in fact, is trying to unlearn all the constructs that were drilled into me when I was a student, like um, perspective and scale and things like that. <coughs> so, that's the lumberjack beard. Now, there's one last thing, one last diagram I want to draw. Because basically you're wondering, where am I going with this? I'm not sure myself. But I think what I, what, the gist of what I'm getting at is that it's okay to colour over the lines, metaphorically speaking, at any given point in your career. And hopefully this diagram will show that. That's my plan. So we've got two converging lines like that. This is a timeline denoted with T, I was listening in some lessons, and basically here is the wide end, the early stages of our, stage of our life. We have a breadth of options, a plethora of opportunities laid out before us, and being children, we can 
colour it in as liberally as we like, it doesn't matter, we're kids, it's fine, no one cares. But then as we get a bit older and a bit more self-conscious, we start to colour in a bit more tidily. Now, I turned 40 a couple of weeks ago, so technically that puts me with current medical advances the way they are, hopefully about halfway down this timeline, that's me. Right, and as you can see, my options have narrowed considerably, okay? But what you can't see, what this diagram doesn't show you, is that just beyond this halfway point, there's this phantom zone here. Now this is what I call the midlife crisis territory, right? <laughs> so here, anything goes literally. Woohoo! It's like being a kid again. No one cares. It's brilliant. You go over lines, it doesn't matter. That's like a veritable Jackson Pollock right there. And what that represents is things like messy divorces, <coughs> impromptu motorbike purchases, um, an unhinged desire to take out a second mortgage and start your own artisan juice bar, all those things 50-year-olds do, okay? <laughs> but then after that, we keep colouring in and the lines get narrower and narrower. Our pen starts to run out of ink. You can read a metaphor into that if you want. <laughs> and then eventually, We get to a full stop at the end, a finite black dot. Now I'm sure you can guess what that represents. If not, I'll make it a bit easier for the ones with less imagination. <laughs> I did warn you it might get more depressing. <laughs> so, basically, that black dot, I think, is the only kind of truth on this whole chart. Everything that precedes it is one big blank colouring in book which is ready to be filled in either with diligent precision or big bold scrawls. Either way, you're not going to be scored out of 10, you're not going to get given a gold star, you're not going to get marked down for it. It's, uh, I think the only parameters that really matter are the ones that measure how content we are at any given point on this timeline. It's very uh, easy to perceive a given career as a goal or destination that we set out to achieve. But in my experience, the problem with having goals is that goalposts inevitably shift and sometimes they just disappear entirely. So I think the key is just to not regret a moment of how we get there. So you may as well be as neat or as messy as you like. Thank you.